In this video, I'd like to look at the different uh, light sources that are available inside 3D Studio Max. Uh, to use light sources, there's a couple of ways that you can add these to your scene. Uh, one is to go to the Create button here uh, and scroll down to the Light section. And there's really two, maybe, I guess you could call it three types of lights. You have photometric lights and standard lights, or the two basic types. You also have a daylight system, which of course simulates the daylight uh, with a like a sun and a sky system. Uh, but photometric lights, um, if you look at this one, you have a couple of options inside these uh, photometric lights. You have a target light, a free light, and this mental ray skylight portal is com is uh, considered to be a uh, a photometric light as well. Uh, under standard lights, you have a target spotlight, free spotlight, uh, directional lights, omni lights, uh, skylight, and then the uh, mental ray equivalent. You have a mental ray area spot and a mental ray omni. Uh, likewise, you can go over instead of going to the create panel, uh, you can come over to the uh, this create panel here and you notice that there's a lights uh, section here. You can have access to the same uh, options here. You have the photometric lights, again you have the target light and the free light and the skylight portal. Uh, the standard lights such as the target spot, uh, the free direct, the omni lights, uh, etc. Uh, this fry option that you didn't see over there, uh, this is a um, secondary third-party renderer that I've installed Fry Render, so you won't see that uh, as a, a default option. You also will not have the V-Ray lights uh, unless you've purchased V-Ray and installed that. So what I have here is a just a basic test scene that I've set up for uh, the scanline renderer. I'll start with that. And what I'll do is uh, to add a light to the scene. I'll just go into the front viewport here and I want to add let's just say a target spotlight to the scene so I'll select which one I want to add so I'm going to use the target spot and then the left mouse button I'll hold it down to create the light source and still holding the left mouse button down I'm dragging uh, to place this target where I want the light target to be so to get an idea of where our light source is I'll go into the perspective view and let me just change the uh, this lighting and shadow right now it's set up to illuminate with default lights uh, when you create a scene there's actually default lighting in that scene you can't see the lights um, because they're kinda hidden away but uh, what uh, when you add a light source your own light source like when I created this target spot uh, light to the scene that turns off or disables those default lights so let me just change this to uh, use our scene light that I've made and as you can see, it's a, a spotlight uh, looking effect that we have here because we're, this is, of course, a spotlight. Uh, what I'll do is go through these settings, uh, rollout by rollout, if you will. Uh, of course, under the light type here, you have the on off uh, button. And you can change this from spotlight to uh, directional and omni, uh, which is actually changing the, the type of light that this is you can see up here it's changing so if you create one and you want another one you don't necessarily have to delete uh, uh, that light source you can always come down and change uh, if you created a spotlight and you wanted an omni you can just change it like that you also have this targeting option right now it's disabled uh, and I can control the target if you will uh, by just using the spinner uh, using the target option is kind of handy, uh, of course, for placement. Let me just switch over to lights so I don't select anything else in the scene. Uh, as you can see, the light is rotating towards that uh, target light. It's pointing towards that target always. Uh, if I turn off that target option, then there's nothing for me to move around. What I have to do is actually rotate that light source like so.
map or something uh, because it's not compatible. Likewise, if you're using mental ray, you don't want to use the scan line uh, shadow types. Beside the enable disable option for the shadows, I have this use global settings button. And what that does, um, let me just make another light source here. I'll make that as a copy instead of an instance so that it's unique. Um, for the lights that have this option enabled, uh, the shadow settings of whichever shadow uh, option you've chosen will change. Uh, like if I change the settings here, it will automatically change the same shadow options on this light. Which means if I if I just leave it at ray trace for now, um, if I come down to the ray trace shadow parameters, you can if I click on both, you can see that they're the same settings. I have the ray bias of 0 0.2, whereas if I change that to let's say three come to the other light, it's the same, it changed the same way, even though this is not an instance version of the light. So if on this light source I remove that use global setting, and then I come back down, uh, and you can see that when you do that it changes uh, shadow mode as well. So let me just go back into ray trace shadows. And let me change this ray bias back down to 0.2. And as you can see, that first light is still it has the ray bias of 3.0. So that uh, that use global settings is just a way to link uh, the settings. If you're using something like ray trace shadows, it's handy uh, because you don't want uh, you may not want different ray trace uh, options. You want them all to be the same. So. If you want the settings for your shadows to be uh, similar across the lights, just make sure that that's enabled uh, on all your light sources, and then you just only have to change one uh, if you want to modify something. Let me delete that light source. Come back to the original light. Let me set that back to the default value. Uh, this next button, the exclude exclude button, uh, let me just give this a render so you can see what we have to begin with. The exclude button will allow you to include or exclude uh, objects to be illuminated from uh, light sources. So basically if I go in uh, I can, as I said, exclude objects or include objects. So if I wanted to focus this light specifically on that uh, gargoyle mesh, I could just move that over and tell it to include uh, only that object. Uh, it's not going to include these because I've man I'm manually telling it what uh, what to include on that light source. So if I just hit OK and give this a render, the only thing that will be illuminated is that gargoyle mesh. Likewise, um, I could let me just reset that. If I wanted to exclude objects from the scene, um, I could do the same thing, and you can do so either you can exclude the shadow casting or the illumination or both. Let me just set this back to the default setting. In the next rollout we have the intensity, color, and attenuation options. Uh, the first option here is the multiplier. Of course that's uh, the strength of this light source. Uh, beside that you have a color swatch here that you can use to tint this light source. Uh, below that you have a dec the, de the decay options uh, and you have two options here, well three I guess you have none, uh, inverse and inverse square. Uh, inverse is a more linear type fall off whereas inverse square uh, has a different, uh, a stronger fall off, if you will. Uh, in the help file, it shows a, a really good example of this a diagram that shows you uh, the inverse decay is just a linear, and it starts right here and just evenly um, dissipates over time, whereas the inverse square decay uh, has a stronger decay value. It's not really linear like the, the inverse decay. Uh, technically speaking, the inverse square option uh, is more accurate to uh, real-world lights uh, than the uh, inverse option. 
However, you may find that uh, the inverse option uh, works a little bit better in your scenes because it's a little uh, more smooth of a decay uh, than the uh, inverse square. And I also believe that uh, the photometric lights, uh, they have this decay option built in. There's no, nothing uh, to configure on those uh, photometric lights, which I'll get to in more depth here shortly. Uh, but they have actual inverse square built in. Um, so again, that's, that's typically the more accurate uh, if you're simulating real world lights. But uh, more so, if you're going to simulate real world lights, you should probably use uh, the photometric lights instead of these standard lights anyway. Uh, below that you have a start option which as you can see, uh, let me just expand this, it shows you here uh, you get a visual representation. It has a, a show option next to it but uh, it seems to show all the time. But this is the point at where uh, that inverse decay is actually going to start happening. It will start at this green point, at this start point and again in the real world uh, a light start a light source will actually start decaying at, uh, at zero basically uh, because there's you know it doesn't start decaying at uh, 20 inches out so uh, that's just another way to um, customize these lights to get the result that you're after uh, rather than solely based on physical accuracy uh, which is good to have both options here but again, uh, this is where the inverse, whether you're using inverse or inverse square, this is where uh, the start point where that decay will start happening. Now since this is more so an automatic decay, uh, you do have, if you want more control over that, you can use these near attenuation and far attenuation settings. Let me just move this light source uh, to make this a little bit easier to see the, the effect that that would have. Let me just set it like so. And I'm going to enable the use and show uh, because we want to see where this is, uh, have a visual representation. So the near attenuation uh, would be uh, the start point is this blue uh, ring, whereas the uh, end point uh, is this one. And then you have the far attenuation would be the next two set of rings here. Uh, if I go in and just start changing this to something like uh, decrease the near attenuation, well let me just render this as a base first. Okay, now I'll decrease the far attenuation to something like 40. And you can already see this uh, getting dimmer in the viewport. Let's make that 25 and uh, the far end here if I bring that to like that you'll see that uh, it basically allows me to tune where that attenuation will occur so again it just gives you a manual control of the decay of the light source uh, instead of using these automatic options let me just turn those back off uh, and then the next rollout I have uh, the spotlight parameters Let me just go move this light source again. And again you have this uh, show cone option but actually it seems to show display uh, at all times so uh, I'm not sure if that's uh, desired but uh, it seems this doesn't work or I'm maybe I'm doing something wrong with it but anyway uh, the show cone should turn that on or off. Uh, this overshoot option if I enable that uh, it basically ignores uh, the cone of this light and it kind of becomes a almost like a an omni light because it's going to ignore that. If I give this a render you'll see uh, it's just overshooting uh, its range and it's just an infinite uh, range at this point instead of the spotlight. Uh, up next I have the hotspot beam and fall off field and what that does is change the the uh, hot spot of this light source. If I decrease that and let's say I wanted to focus on that object do like so and what that's going to do is give me a, a brighter source of light here uh, and then gradually fade out. I can increase uh, that fall off field 
and likewise you could decrease it if you needed a, uh, a very tight focus light. Now this is obviously set up as a circular spotlight, but you could also have a rectangle uh, shape here, and you can change the aspect ratio. You could also drive this aspect ratio with this bitmap option if you wanted to assign a bitmap here. Okay, I'm just going to change this back to a circular light source and move on to the next rollout, which is the advanced effects rollout. Uh, first couple of options that you have here would be the contrast and soften uh, diffuse edges options. Uh, the contrast does exactly what you think it would do. It would make the contrast uh, of this light source more harsh as you increase this. It's probably difficult to uh, see in this particular scene. And it's mostly a, a subtle effect. Well, actually, both of these are a rather subtle effect. Uh, for example, the soften diffuse uh, edge option. Uh, that mainly comes into play when you have like an ambient light source. So what I'll do is just uh, put in some ambient light here. Something like so. And let me give this a render. And I'll just put this in the RAM player and uh, make some changes to that setting and we can compare the results. So what I'll do is max this out uh, at 100 and give that a render and just put this in the RAM player as well. And as you can see the result is, is very uh, rather subtle if you will. Uh, this side is the side that uh, has 100% uh, uh, softened soften diffuse edges and it just makes uh, the light not as harsh uh, but again that mainly works with uh, with that, like an ambient light source and that ambient light source is just a uniform amount of light uh, that's added to the scene as you can see it, it can wash out uh, your your shadows and things like that so use that very carefully um, if you're using again something like mental ray with uh, uh, photometric lights and things like that you probably don't want to use that ambient light because it will uh, wash out a lot of your shadows uh, in detail so let me just go back in and, and turn that back to black let's drag that one okay under th under these two settings you have the diffuse specular and ambient only options uh, right now this light is going to contribute to the diffuse color of the scene as well as the specular component. If I uncheck that, I believe it, you could see it here in the viewport. Yeah, uh, that's just the specular highlights. If you turn that off, then you won't have the specular highlights uh, from this light source. If I turn off diffuse, well, I don't have any light at all. Uh, if I just want the specular uh, component, then I can just use the specular option. Uh, if I enable ambient only, uh, you can see you kind of get like a z-depth uh, look here, but uh, the ambient is basically similar to that ambient light that I used uh, here. Uh, it doesn't produce shadows, uh, so it's just more so a uniform uh, light source, but if you use this, you can obviously set the uh, the fall off and the decay type uh, parameters. So I'll just set that back to the default where it produces uh, diffuse and specular components. Uh, in the next section I have the projector map option and what this does is obviously it will project uh, either a bitmap or a, one of these procedurals uh, whatever you want it to uh, a, as this light source it will project that so for example I'm just going to select this checker uh, procedural map and drag that over to the uh, material editor as an instance copy so that I can change uh, the values here Let me just give it uh, like a blue setting and maybe change the tiling on it to uh, something like this. And while you won't see that in the viewport, if I give this a render, you'll see the effect that it has. That light source is actually projecting uh, the color as well as the, uh, the shape of that checker map. So what I'll do is just cut that out and disable that and move on to the next rollout. 
in the next rollout I have the shadow parameters which uh, would be uh, things like the shadow color uh, if I wanted a different shadow color I could do that Uh, the density is how strong that uh, shadow is. Again, this will come into play more so uh, with if you're using like an ambient light source. Uh, the map option here, what you can do with this is assign a uh, bitmap or again you could use a procedural uh, anything that you want to drive the color of the shadows. Uh, again, if I go in and uh, let's just put a checker map here and give that a render. Uh, you can see how some of the shadows are different color, uh, basically where um, where that checker pattern is, which you can't really see because it's only affecting the shadows instead of the uh, the diffuse lighting. If I bring up the material editor and instance this over to the material editor and just change these colors around. you'll see that's changing the the color of the shadows Let me just cut that uh, this next option the light effect shadow color uh, what that does when it's on it blends uh, the light color with the shadow color here so if I assign something like a red uh, had a light color actual color here of yellow and had these object shadows of red it would blend between those two colors uh, the atmosphere shadows, uh, if that's on, that's going to work with the atmospheric effects, which I'm not really going to get into at this point. Uh, that will probably be more so of a, a volumetric discussion. Uh, here we have the ray trace shadow parameters. Uh, that would change. That would be there if I was using something like uh, uh, area shadows or shadow map. Naturally, that's specific to uh, using ray trace shadows. Here in the ray trace shadow parameters, we have a ray bias setting, uh, which drives uh, the distance from the shadows can be from the object. Uh, if you increase this, the shadows will be farther away from the object. Likewise, if you decrease it, uh, they'll be closer. Let me just give this a render and increase this to, uh, let me just say 10. You can see how it's moving those shadows away from the objects here. So you probably want to leave that uh, at the default setting or a little bit lower uh, if for uh, added realism. The two-sided shadows option uh, takes into consideration if you have uh, whether your mesh is two-sided or not. Uh, if it if you want it to calculate the shadows uh, on the inside of a mesh or not, in other words. Uh, this max quad tree depth, uh, if you're familiar with mental ray, it's kind of like a trace depth setting. Uh, it's basically uh, adjusting the depth uh, used by the ray tracer. A greater uh, value here can improve the overall look of the ray tracing, uh, but it will at the cost of memory and probably rendering time. So you basically want to set that up for the minimum amount that you need in your scene. Uh, the default of 7 works pretty good. Okay, in the next rollout, what we have is the atmospheric uh, and effects. Uh, for example, if you wanted to make this a volume light or use lens effects on the light, uh, you would add that here. Uh, again, I'm not going to get into that uh, because it's, I'm, I will have a separate uh, volumetric uh, video. And finally, you have an indirect, uh, mental ray indirect illumination rollout, which uh, doesn't come into play here with the uh, scanline renderer, uh, but it's still there. Okay, next I want to go over the uh, photometric lights and uh, probably the mental ray lights. So what I'll do is switch over to mental ray uh, and I have a similar scene already set up. Uh, instead of scanline, it's set up for mental ray. So I'll just load that. Uh, yeah, sure. And so again, I'll go to my create panel here and this time I'll go to the photometric light sources. And again, I have a target light and a free light. Uh, since I used a, a target light last time, I'll just pop a free light in here. Uh, and what it is, is just a light without a target, obviously. 
Okay, so going into this, uh, the settings here on this photometric light, uh, you'll see it looks different than the, the uh, settings on the standard lights. Uh, for one big difference, for example, uh, on a standard light, uh, you have the settings in like 0, 1, 5 uh, for intensity. Let me just add a uh, standard light here to show you. If you look at the settings here, I have a multiplier here. I, I'm not sure what the the wattage or candela value of that is because it's just a, a generic number. Whereas on the uh, photometric lights, I can specify whatever candela uh, that I want this uh, light source to be. So you can already see how these are more so geared towards uh, representing actual light sources than the than the standard lights are. Uh, the first rollout that you'll have for the photometric lights are the templates and here you can load up uh, different templates uh, for example a 40 watt bulb, a 60 watt bulb uh, I'll just configure this as a 60 watt bulb uh, below that I have similar options to the standard lights of course on off uh, I can make this a targeted light uh, for example and again it works just like the uh, uh, targeted other uh, standard lights Uh, below that we have our shadow types. Again, since I'm using mental ray, I'll want to use either ray trace or the mental ray shadow maps, so I'm just going to leave it at ray traced. The same exclude options uh, that we have on the standard lights. Uh, here under light distribution type, I have a couple of options here. Uh, I, it's defaults to this uniform spherical, uh, meaning that uh, it's going to emit light in all directions. I can change that to uniform diffuse, and it will only emit light uh, in one direction here. Let me just move this down to make that uh, a little more obvious. If I expand that viewport, maximize that viewport and switch, uh, you can see how, uh, let me go back up, it changes the where you're located. Uh, if I go from uniform spherical to uniform diffuse, uh, you can see how it cuts that light off behind. It's only emitting towards uh, the uh, target point here. I can also set this up as a spotlight and I would have the same uh, spotlight options that I have uh, for the standard spotlights. I can also set this up for a photometric web. Uh, this is where you would assign an IES profile uh, to the light source which an IES profile uh, basically gives you uh, manufacturer uh, measured data from a given light source and it can produce sort of uh, the effect of that particular light source uh, including like the caustic effects um, of it of that light source going through like the lens of of the light fixture what I'll do is just quickly go and grab uh, an IES light here or profile uh, you can download these uh, on from the web uh, at um, light manufacturers at many places such as Urco. Uh, there's lots of places just do a Google search for IES files uh, and you can find plenty of them. Uh, I'll just grab some I guess this one. You can see you're going to get kind of a preview of what this light profile is going to do. And if I add that to the scene uh, you kind of can see here in the viewport what that uh, how that profile matches this this uh, preview. Let's see if I can find a different one. There we go. So as you can tell, it's it looks like this light is being uh, fired through like a lens on a uh, a light fixture because you get this pattern uh, that you can obviously see here. So. Uh, this IES data will give you some fairly uh, accurate results, especially if you're uh, if you have a specific light fixture and you're trying to match that uh, with the lighting data uh, from the manufacturer of that uh, light fixture. You can get some very accurate results with this. Uh, you can also go in and rotate uh, the IES profile right from uh, the options here on the rotate options here. Oops. 
and as I rotate and I get this up to a certain value normally what I'll do is just if I want to reset that back to zero uh, I'll just right click on the spinner uh, with my mouse and that resets uh, to the default value which is zero so a photometric light is the only light that you can assign this IES profile to you can't assign an IES file uh, to a standard light source. This is only uh, specific to the photometric lights. Uh, one other note about the photometric lights uh, in addition to uh, changing the uh, look of the light source it also changes the intensity. Uh, the intensity uh, is inside of that light uh, that IES profile and again that's measured from uh, the factory that, or the person that created that uh, particular IES file. Hopefully it came from a uh, reliable source such as a lighting manufacturer so that you know that it's an accurate uh, result for that particular IES profile. Okay, In the next section here I have the uh, intensity color and attenuation options. Uh, I can specify a Kelvin value uh, for this light source again for uh, the most real realistic results here. Uh, I can provide that via this Kelvin setting and as you can see the the, the colors change as I uh, go through the Kelvin uh, values here. Lower values represent warmer light sources uh, and again you can look this up uh, there's some good charts on the internet uh, for Kelvin values for example uh, like tungsten light sources uh, I believe are in the range of 2800 uh, to 3200 so somewhere in that range, uh, it depends on the light source. It could be between between those values uh, that would give you the correct color uh, for a tungsten light source. Uh, below that, uh, you have a filter color. If you wanted to go in and modify that uh, color, you could do so here. Just keep in mind that's also based off of this Kelvin color. So you can see how that's as I go more red, that's kind of combine that red from that uh, low Kelvin value with this blue or orange if you will. Um, so keep that in mind if you use this filter color. And of course you have the intensity settings here. You can use candela or lumen values. Uh, you could also use a percentage uh, if need be, uh, to dial down the uh, percentage of that light uh, energy. Of course when you do that, uh, especially if you're using these IES profiles, uh, you're getting away from the accuracy um, of using the IES profiles uh, if you go in and start changing this percentage rate. Uh, here we have uh, the far attenuation options. Uh, this is similar to what you have on the um, on the standard lights. Uh, the difference here is that this will come in handy uh, when you have a lot of photometric lights in a scene, uh, specifically something like an architectural interior scene. Uh, generally the more photometric lights that you have uh, the slower that it's going to be for it to render. Well you can speed up your renders by limiting uh, this attenuation especially on light sources that are um, out of view of the camera uh, things like that so it's not calculating those shadows those uh, area shadows for things like that uh, but uh, this is a real time saver uh, for preventing this uh, light source from uh, ca having a infinite calculations if you will uh, you can limit uh, its um, ray trace calculations by using this far attenuation and speed up your renders. And again the controls are similar to uh, the attenuation on the standard lights. As you can see the light uh, gets stronger, uh, the fall off gets stronger here uh, as I increase this. That's probably a little more obvious. Uh, in the next roll out here we have emit light from shape. Uh, this will turn this light into an area light source and area light sources uh, give you those soft shadows uh, area shadows if you will. And So uh, let me just render this as a point light first. Probably best for me to get rid of this IES profile because that may uh, 
be confusing to look at once I start talking about the shadows here. So I'm just going to change that back to Uniform Diffuse. Okay, so let me just give this a render. And I'll just put this in the RAM player so that we can make a comparison. To a, uh, I'll make this, let's say, a disk. And you can already see the change that happened to the viewport here. So I'll load this into the other channel of the RAM player. And you can see that now we're getting those soft shadows. Uh, and they're accurate in that uh, they get uh, more distorted, uh, more blurry uh, at distance from the object. You can see I get a sharp shadow here, uh, but a, a blurry shadow at distance, which is the accurate result for a, an uh, area light source. If you wanted that effect to be more pronounced, uh, the larger the light source, the more diffused those shadows will be. So I'll just go up and make this light source uh, larger. And that will make the uh, effect more evident here. Uh, the larger the light source, the more uh, powerful those area shadows are going to be. You're still going to get the sharp sharpness uh, right at the base of the object, but it, it will just go to a more blurry state uh, faster and obviously a stronger uh, blur effect on these shadows uh, with these larger light sources. So I'll set that back to uh, 6. Uh, if you want that light source to be visible in the render, uh, that would be this, this circular cone here. Let me just switch to a, a different view here. You could enable the, the shape here in the viewport or uh, in the uh, render settings here. And that makes that light source a visible light source. Of course, you have uh, the shadow samples here as well uh, when you're using ray traced shadows. Uh, if you notice that there's some grain or noise in these uh, shadows here, I could decrease that by increasing uh, the number of s samples here uh, on those shadows. Of course, when you do that, uh, your render times will increase as well. Uh, so you only want to go as high as you absolutely need to. You don't want to just go in and randomly set that to a value. Uh, you, you want to spend some time doing a couple of test renders uh, so that you can save some some render time on your final render uh, by not having this higher than it needs needs to be. And again, uh, there's as you can see, there's multiple uh, shapes that you can use here. Uh, the point light, and if you use that, uh, you're not going to get any area shadows. That's just emitting from a point. Uh, line, obviously, you're you're going to emit across that line. Um, you have a rectangle and obviously the disk that we used. Uh, you have a sphere and a cylinder. And so you can emit uh, light from various shapes here and once you move out of uh, this point light and onto these other options such as line, rectangle, uh, disk, sphere, or cylinder uh, you're creating an area light with soft shadows. Uh, here we have the same ray traced uh, settings from the uh, standard lights. Again, the atmospheric effects, uh, you would add the volume light or lens effects if, if uh, needed for this light, which uh, I'll just ignore that for now. Uh, the same advanced effect rollout, uh, you have the contrast, uh, diffuse options that we talked about earlier, and of course you have uh, the mental ray indirect illumination uh, roll out here, which I won't go into. That's more so a, obviously an indirect illumination discussion. And so that's a couple of basic light types that you have here. Let me just delete that light source uh, because I want to look at uh, the couple of other options here. You have the mental ray sky portal, which uh, obviously uh, the primary use for that uh, is with uh, the daylight system. And what that will do is push in uh, the light from uh, through your windows, uh, help Final Gather uh, get a good solution uh, using these uh, portal lights. But you can also use them as an area light uh, if you like. So what I'll do is just go in and 
here on the parameters obviously you have an on off and a multiplier uh, filter color just like with the other lights if I change that it's going to change the color of the light source uh, the difference here is you either have shadows or you don't. Uh, these are ray trace shadows. This is an area light. Uh, so you either turn it on or off. You don't switch in between uh, shadow maps or ray trace. You don't have to worry about that here. Again, we have uh, shadow samples uh, to smooth out that grain in those area, sha uh, area shadows. Uh, this from outdoors option is uh, basically if you have this set up uh, in a window in an architectural scene it will consider what's behind this light uh, if you have a tree or something like that it will take that in consider into consideration uh, when it's uh, pushing the light into your room and you have the uh, of course the dimensions of the light source uh, this will flip the direction of the light and this will make it visible in the renderer so for example if I want to come in and uh, make this visible. I'm just going to come down and tell it use custom and instead of using the scene environment which is black or the uh, skylight which I don't have in the scene. Uh, let me see if this actually shows up. Okay. So it's a little bit bright and I just need to change. It was a little bit bright. I just needed to uh, change my exposure settings a little bit here uh, and give this a render. You can see how that's uh, producing an area light effect here. Uh, they're pretty good to use uh, outside of the norm by using this as an area light. Uh, I'll have a separate video on, on how you can do that, but uh, they're pretty handy for using uh, instead of a skylight portal as another area light option. Then of course you have the, uh, the this daylight system and let me just go here and create a daylight system. Uh, tell it yes to the exposure control option when it asks you uh, because if you don't it's going to just render white. Uh, it will also go ahead and create the mental ray sky for you. And so there I've added a daylight system to the scene. Um, uh, again, I won't go into in-depth detail on this because that's a separate uh, separate video in itself. Uh, but uh, that, I believe, will cover most of the lights that you're going to use. Uh, there's also, uh, if I go in here to the standard light, uh, you have a skylight option. And that produces almost like an ambient light source. Uh, with mental ray, uh, you use that... Uh, to create things like HDR renders you use uh, the uh, the skylight option again I'll get more in depth into that once I start talking about uh, HDR discussions and things like that that will come in into play but that is a discussion on your light options uh, in 3D Studio Max and uh, that concludes this video